Hi, I'm Lucas Meldon and welcome to That Windsurf Podcast. This is the podcast where we have conversations with people in and around the windsurf community with a new topic and new guests each week. If you enjoyed the podcast, then don't hesitate to give it a like and subscribe so you're up to date with all the latest ones. If you're feeling extra generous, you can always head over to buymeacoffee.com slash lucask579. That will be in the description and that will be very much appreciated. So yeah, if you know anybody else who might like it, then let them know and share the pod. It's now up on a few platforms, Spotify, Google Podcasts. Anyway, enough about that. Let's get into it. It felt like the end of the world. Double mast fire waves. 76 knots. It felt like your hands were going to explode. Crazy, crazy storm. Die and not come home. How's it going, people? We had a little break from the podcast, but we're back. And today we've got a super exciting topic. To break it all down with me, we have Fanatic R&D Man, the competitive machine that's Glass Foggett, and we've also got Aussie Ripper and Red Bull Storm Chase champion, Jager Stone. Welcome, guys. How's it going? Thank you. Welcome. It's, uh, it's pretty good on this end. We are kind of lucky in Germany with the lockdown so far. Um, we've been in the water the whole time, so it wasn't too bad for us. And uh, that made the situation of not traveling around pretty sweet. I mean, especially for me living right up at the coast, it, uh, it wasn't the worst times. And normally this time of the year, I don't, have, don't see my family that much. I'm, we're hanging out on Maui, do the photo shoots and all that. So this year was a little bit of a special year where I saw my, my boys. And uh, we had an epic April with lots of sunshine and the guys being ripping up our little bay on their tiny little boogie boards and little surfboards and <laughs> flipping around in the water the whole time. So it was, it was quite good. So not too bad. Jager, how's it been in Australia? I think the season's ended actually for wind, isn't it? So how's that been? Yeah, um, yeah, like class, well, we've been really lucky here in, in Western Australia as well. Um, I was actually due to fly out to Maui uh, in the beginning of March, but with everything that went down, I decided to put my flight on hold. And then the day I was meant to fly out again is when the Australian government basically announced that everyone should uh, stay put for the time being and they'd close the borders. So yeah, we've been really lucky here. I've just been hanging out, surfing, windsurfing still quite a bit um, and just studying some physiotherapy or, or revising and um, yeah doing a little bit of work here and there as well so it's been good to enjoy home and um, yeah just spend some time here that I never really get to do so it's good. Yeah I guess most most years you're, you're in the Canaries every summer so this is the first year for quite a few years I guess. Yeah normally I would spend um, you know, four to six, six weeks in Maui in sort of March, April. And this week I would normally fly out or last week to the Canaries for three months. So um, it's a bit different this year, but yeah, I think we're all in a pretty lucky position compared to a lot of people. Yeah, for sure. Are you doing something? Have you got a new hobby that's keeping you entertained in these times? Um yeah, so I've just been, I've still been able to windsurf quite a bit. It's not as windy now, but um, been doing that a lot. And yeah, like I said, surfing, I've been diving a lot as well. And uh, yeah, revising a lot of my physiotherapy studies, doing some professional development courses online. Um, yeah, and just trying to switch on that part of my brain a bit, I guess. Uh, I had a knee injury at the end of last year. Um, which kept me out for four months. So just continuing on with, with my rehab and, um, you know, trying to build my confidence with, with what I'm doing again. What's What's winging yet? <laughs> no, no winging yet. <laughs> but I did have a go at windsurf foiling, and that, okay. was, that was really fun. I enjoyed that quite a bit. Okay, then you're going to love winging. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that, then we come to my answer. Uh, I, I guess I already answered my uh, the, that question. Um, since we can't really move out of of, of the Bay of Kiel or basically uh, northern Germany at the moment, Denmark is still closed borders. We don't get to wave sail that much, and the wind is not that consistent here, so we get just wing days every single day. <laughs> um, that that's pretty pretty epic. All my windsurfing friends around me they all got into it, and we have this little wing crew here that is uh, filling up my local bay 
with last weekend, I think it was something like 20 wings in the water. And it just goes in, in less than 10 knots, easy, tons of fun. And then up till, up till we put our wave stuff in the car. It's fully taken off here at least. Like some, some people get here and they're like, what's that? I've never seen it. And uh, also some other windsurfers come here and they're like, what the hell is happening here in this bay? <laughs> but it's just, uh, it's kind of the super spreader effect here. I, I came with that first wing from a dealer meeting last year in, in Tenerife, took it back home and then all my friends tried it and everybody, like over the not last uh, weeks and months, they all knocked on my doors with the slightest breeze of wind and wanted to have a wing board and a wing. And <laughs> when I had home office to do, they would, they all went in the bay. So now it's, it's just growing. Everybody's getting on it. It's pretty funny. Yeah, it's definitely like taking over a lot of the professional guys as well on tour are getting into it, aren't they? So yeah, yeah, it's uh, just yeah. it's not really in conflict with windsurfing with what with what we do because for us here it just starts to be interesting above twenty knots really in the Baltic Sea, North Sea. Although I think the problem is it it might be a bit too addictive because I know like there was some like an epic day in Tenerife and you were. Uh, out wing for him instead <laughs> that was just that was just trying where it goes because i never took it on waves and i just that was just the last quick session before i took a flight and i took all the stuff there and i thought i might as well just see if if it goes through the white water see how you, you can jump with it and it wasn't a wing. it wasn't a real wing day it would have been better on a windsurf it was fun anyways so jager you're not you're not convinced ah uh. I don't know. I'll give it a go for sure, but there's so many things, you know, like trying to fit in surfing and diving and windsurfing already. So I'm uh, quite entertained already. But yeah, it does look fun. And foiling from what I've done is is a really unique sensation. So it would You've be got a very good fun. conditions where you are. That's the yeah. difference. We don't have them, so we have to make something out of it. Yeah, 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 for sure. Well, that's interesting. The winging. Hopefully, I get to try it as well one day. Uh, but we're here to talk about windsurfing, and uh, I want to start off by talking about your windsurfing background and stories, how you got into it. When when did you start windsurfing? How old were you? I started um, not super, like not as early as most of the kids now. Um, I think I was about twelve, and um, I'm from a little town in the northwest of Germany, which is not far from the North Sea, but there, there was a lake which was about 15 kilometers from the house of my parents. And my parents had a, like a weekend, little weekend house there, right at the lake. And that's where I found this old 10K windsurfer with a wooden boom uh, back in 92, I think it was. And my brothers and I, we just tried to put it together and tried everything that was lying around there, all those little sailboats and and that windsurfer thing, and that was what got us addicted. <laughs> and in the end, my dad saw that uh, we were fully into it, and then he bought a, a Fnatic Rat, which was like a two meter eighty. Back then, it was probably something like a free ride, free ride slalomy board. And with that thing, it kicked off. We just uh, we had a four seven Fnatic rig, like a pretty cheap rig, but it it did the job and got us all completely addicted. And then, yeah, then I finished uh, school in Germany in, I think, 98. And that only then I started to, to get more and, more and more into wave sailing. So I moved to Norderney, which is uh, not far from the little town where I grew up, but it's probably the best wave spot in Germany. Everybody just knows Silt as the German wave spot, but it's Norderney is like Silt, but sideshow pretty much all the time. Is that an island as well? That's an island as well, yeah. So you need to take a ferry. You can't go with a train. That makes it a bit hard to get to, and you don't. You're not allowed to drive on the island with a car. So I moved to that island. The, the year of civil service, what you do, what you had to do back then, instead of military, if you don't want to shoot. So I did that, and uh, that was basically my ticket to get into competition sailing. And I was windsurfing every day. Bernd Flesner is from that island, so. He was kind of my main opponent in the next competitions we had. I went straight from like not really wave sailing to competing against him. And then I got an invitation to World Cup Silt and that's how it all started. Yeah. And next to uni, um, I did, uh, I, I started to do the, the World Tour events. So that's about 20 years ago. 
Yeah. And yeah, but for sure you've been like one of the, the top competitors because I think it was like, correct me if I'm wrong, but like eight years in the top 10 or something like that. So yeah, something like pretty that. Pretty consistent. There was, there was one year I was about just missed the podium. Um, there were a couple of years around 2008, 9, 10, um, I think it was, where um, I was in, we had really good conditions in World Cup Zilt. And that was always my best event. I mean, knowing the North Sea so well, of course, helped. And um, in 2009, I think I finished fourth in the end. So in Zilt, I finished second and then I was fourth. But then I had a lot of years where I was around seventh, eighth place, something like this. Ah, oh, cool story. Um, thanks for that. Jager, how did you, how old were you when you first started? Yeah, I began when I was 11. Um, so yeah, not that young either, but my dad has shaped surfboards for 35 or 40 years now, but um, a lot of the original windsurfers in town actually asked him to start shaping sailboards for them. Um, and where I live in Geraldton is windy every day in summer. So, yeah, to understand what he was doing, he got into windsurfing and then he learned the basics and, and then started bringing me along. And, yeah, on the West Australian coast, it's, it's windy all the time. So we, we came quite obsessed with it, I think, and uh, spent a lot of time in the water. And, yeah, I think I went away on my first windsurfing trip when I was 12, um, I did a competition in Lancelin and I was with Scotty and Ben Severn and Luke Wormsley and Ty Bodycoat and all those guys. And yeah, Severn Sales, Ben started supporting me from, from when I was 12 and that age and Starboard and Severn were very closely affiliated then as well. So I flew out to Hawaii a year or so later and yeah, I guess windsurfing's been quite a big focus since then did my first world tour event in 2015 or 16 um, in Pozo and stayed with Scotty and yeah I, f I finished school when I was 17 and I planned to do the the world tour from then on but I injured my foot and I don't know I, I did recognize the importance and, and my parents really encouraged me to get a, a degree at university as well so I actually put uni up on windsurfing on hold for four years and ended up studying uh, physiotherapy. And I'm, I'm quite glad how it's all worked out, really. Um, you know, I've got something to fall back on and, and a physio degree, and I quite enjoy having a balance of, of work and windsurfing um, as such. But, yeah, since 2014, I've been full-time on the tour and just doing a little bit of physio here and there. And and when you're studying at uni, were you like studying somewhere where you could windsurf or was it like full-time study? Yeah, so I had to move to Perth, um, which is still in WA. It's still windy there, but we didn't have any waves. But the way our university year ran was I would essentially have the summer holidays off. So I would have two to three months of windsurfing at home. Yeah, uni was the focus, but I still got to windsurf a lot of the time, especially over summer. So it was, uh, yeah, it, it was a good balance. I, Perth was okay. It was, I mean, in the scheme of things, it's not a big city, but being from a smaller country um, city as such, it's, it is massive compared to what I was used to and very different. Yeah. And do you think like taking a little bit of time out and then coming back to the world tour really, really helped you actually? Yeah, potentially. I'm not too sure. I think it, uh, I think physio has taught me a lot about how to manage certain things. Um, it's taught me how to have a good balance of work and windsurfing and, and working out my interests, um, how to manage my injuries physically and mentally and, and even just um, manage, I guess, the feelings and the processes you go through as a competitive windsurfer. Um, it's helped me with a lot of those things. So, yeah, I'm I'm really glad I did it. And, um, yeah, I mean, the only thing is, you know, I could have potentially focused on windsurfing full time over those years and, and maybe I would be much better at windsurfing or I could do doubles like Philip or Brow. But uh, as Brow always says, you know, if I had six tits, I'd be a pig and 
I'm pretty happy that I've, I've got a physio degree to fall back on. So, yeah, it's good. It's good to have a balance. I think that's, that's been the best thing. I'm glad you did your physio thing. You would have yeah. destroyed us <laughs> like, like you do now, much earlier. Uh, this is actually something I'm, I'm curious to know from your point of view, Jager, but like, like when you look at Australia and WA, like some of the, the spots there are like unreal and you got like the whole summer as well. But you mm. only see like one or two guys like actually in the tour. Like you're actually, I think, the only Australian from the tour and then there's only sort of one or two guys. Why, why do you think that's the case? Um, yeah, I think access to windsurfing has been quite difficult. And, you know, surf, uh, Australia has such a big surfing culture, but... Yeah. yeah, I think access to cheap and affordable windsurfing gear has had some sort of an impact on it. Whether the image of windsurfing in Australia is cool amongst all the surfers, you know, they're, they're the sort of things that I'm trying to break down and, and work on with Starboard and Severn is appealing to those younger generations. There's amazing windsurfers here, but... You know, all the kids that are doing it are only kids who have parents that windsurf and who can um, pass down their gear or, or are interested in, in investing in some gear for their kids. So, yeah, it's, um, it's a bit of a shame because WA is amazing for windsurfing. But, yeah, at the moment, it's, it's just not overly popular amongst the younger kids, I suppose. Yeah. It's quite a difference to like Germany, for instance. Well, you can't really surf in Germany. <laughs> like, <laughs> I heard they're building some kind of wave wave garden now, and not far from Hamburg. But I mean, most guys that surf, like who surf in Germany, they're just traveling. But there's not real surf spots in Germany itself. Like, it's very rare that you have a wave that's that's good. So you can wind surf on every lake, and it's it's been a, a like a long history in, in of, of windsurfing in germany with um the older generation like pretty much everyone had contact with windsurfing and had a windsurfer flying around and um it's up to us to to push and get the kids also interested in it now it's it's becoming more and more difficult like i got dragged in because my parents had a board and now i'm getting my kids dragged in but i don't see kids from people who, who don't have contact with windsurfing they they just don't get in contact with it. So that's what we have to, to focus on together to get more people in that are not, that don't have that background or parents connection to windsurfing. Like all the windsurfing kids here now, and, and it's a lot, they all have really good windsurfers as parents that brings them in. And I think pretty much that whole Pozo kids crew of PWA juniors, uh, most of them or pretty much everyone has, has a windsurfing background in their family. I think a big thing in Australia and, and the way I see my job is just trying to promote windsurfing. A lot of people have the perception that it's quite outdated, you know, and so trying to really promote it as almost motocross mixed with surfing, you know, it's so extreme and the things we do are mind blowing to so many people, but actually getting that out there. So yeah, working with your sponsors and, and with, you know, local television and pushing on social media, like that's the way I try and see it at the moment and, and trying to get those younger kids to see it. So maybe they ask mum and dad, you know, like, oh, I want to give this a go. And it's about like in Geraldton where I live, working with the Geraldton Windsurfing Club and um, getting these grants and working with Windsurfing WA to have, you know, like windsurfing camps or, or coaching sessions where all the beginner gear is there and kids can just come down and have a go um, and they don't need to buy that gear straight away, you know, but just to create some interest and, and give them a shot without having to invest thousands of dollars. To wrap this up, have you seen the next Jaggerstone out there, a mini Jaggerstone? <laughs> is there one coming um, up? Yeah, there's, yeah there, actually there's some kids down in Margaret River that are um, out there riding some pretty big waves and there's some kids in Geraldton as well. Yeah, my brother's really good at windsurfing and he's he keeps getting better and better, especially at wave riding. But 
he's a bit older now. He's 27, I think, and um, he's just doing it for fun. But he's been really good to push me and, and help me with, uh, you know, promoting the sport. I have some juniors here in my neighborhood, which their parents have been competing as well. And uh, one, of, one of their parents is actually, it's, his name is Philip. And his sale number was given to Philip Costa. He was G44 <laughs> before. And now his kids are pushing super hard, the, especially the younger one. It's like, there's a lot, a lot of talent coming up. But also another neighbor here from me who's uh, one of my best windsurfing buddies. Um, he's got four kids and all four of them are already windsurfing, like from seven to the age of 13 or 14. And the, the, the older ones doing forwards and all that. So it's, it's good. There's some, yeah. <laughs> some new little juniors also here coming up. So now we're going to get into the main topic this episode, which is the Red Bull Storm Chase. Uh, it's been one I wanted to do right from the start when I was thinking of doing these. And basically, yeah, it's the, one of the biggest events in windsurfing, I would say. It's like the, the Red Bull rampage of windsurfing. It's probably the most extreme competition we're ever going to get. Class, obviously, you, you were involved a lot in the behind the scenes and the organization. So tell us a little bit about how it all started, the idea, and how you got Red Bull involved in it. Um, it initially, I was uh, not really, uh, really involved in the organization. I have some, because during my, my studies in Kiel, I met these guys who started there, um, started doing videos, and then I started to with a media agency. Um, and they named themselves uh, BSP Media. Uh, in the beginning, Big Sexy Pictures, and they made some winter videos back then. Um, I was I was uh, in in one of their first videos in which which we filmed in Norway, uh, like a, a road trip in a big horse transporter, and they came up uh, with this idea of running a windsurf contest not based on some date, but running it based on a massive forecast and um they then uh, created this this uh, concept and it was a little bit of a um, coincidence that um that they ended up with that concept at red bull and he got that idea on the table and he was like that saves me that's kind of what i need and loved it so much that they got the budget to do it um, the, the initial one was a completely different concept. It wasn't really um, a contest. It was more like a media production. Uh, the idea was a big storm hits Northern Europe and crews of two sailors plus camera team is going to sail that storm in different locations. And it was not purely based on professionals. It was, uh, it was a, an open voting, uh, which then later got changed out of safety reasons it was uh, in the in the first one was kind of also a little bit of a learning uh, phase and uh, it was a big online voting i was voted in as uh, one of the riders in germany there were some some other pro riders back then who were involved uh, i think brand profit was one phil horrocks uh, uh, robert sand in denmark and but there were also some more amateurs in, involved and then uh, yeah i was I could basically choose which place I wanted to go in, in when the storm actually hit. It was a massive one that hit basically all of Europe um, over, over two days. And I went to this island, Norderney, which I just told you about. And uh, we got a storm of, uh, I think it, they measured 156 kilometers. It was a big, a big thing for me back then. It was probably, it was by far the biggest media output I ever had with windsurfing, even though back then I already was like right up in the German tour and did World Cup competitions, but nothing came close to the output that came out of that event. The, uh, what, what Red Bull uh, and Red Bull Media House afterwards and their distribution, what they achieve with, with bringing windsurfing to the public is, is crazy. I ended up in like uh, Men's Health magazine and like massive media mainstream media and uh i think there was a 20 minute tv documentation running multiple times in, in two different channels and so it was huge then after a couple of years they they thought okay we need to we need to evolve that concept and get on to get a contest format in uh going and uh they started to rethink everything the second one they were thinking we make it 
big. Uh, we need a bigger team. We need a bigger safety team. Uh, we make three missions. That was the idea. And then they basically got me involved as a uh, sports director um, to make with them together the contest format, um, how we're going to run it, be the, the link to, to the riders and, and all that. And uh, I was also in, like the idea was basically open up worldwide. And uh, that was a big challenge, of course, because we had to look at uh, places where we've never been to, so Southern Hemisphere, Northern Hemisphere. Yeah, then um, the, the, the first one, we decided to, to make everything happen in a period of four, uh, four months, which uh, turned out to be uh, completely uh, not really working for us. In the end, uh, we, we made it happen in two years. Like the first one was in January 2012 in, in Ireland. Uh, the, the idea was that we had 10 riders, competing against each other with uh, being being judged by, by three judging professionals, which I was one of, but uh, we got Duncan Coombs involved as well as the head judge. Then bring that crew down to the top six that uh, qualify for the next mission. And that mission then was in Tasmania, Southern Hemisphere, August 2013. And that one, then we had the top four qualifying for uh, the final mission, which was January 2014. And that one we went to uh, to Cornwall for uh, yeah crazy crazy storm. Basically, the funny thing was that the first one we thought is is pretty much unbeatable. What we got, seventy five, seventy six knots, just crazy winds. Yeah. Then wow. the second one we got was a crazy wave. Like when you look at the waves, uh, we had gusts in the night between eighty, I think around eighty nine knots, but during the day, it was a little less, quite a bit less actually, uh, but the, the wave conditions were epic. We went to this place in, uh, in Tasmania called uh, Back of Lighthouse, like a reef break uh, with, with, with a pretty epic wave. It felt like the end of the world. Yeah, and then we thought, how can we ever top that? And then the final one was uh, in Cornwall where we got the mix of everything, basically. We got huge waves. I, I think I saw waves breaking like double mast high. And at the same time, like a double mast high beach break. And at the same time, uh, we got at the same day, like cross off down the line sailing just up, up in the other corner of the bay. Yeah. Yeah. Never seen yeah so that was, that was completely crazy. And then we needed a break because, uh, that, that the whole mission was such a big, uh, logistical thing and everybody who was involved, um, was kind of on standby of a period of two years always looking into forecasts, then it didn't happen. Then uh, you basically work into it for, for a week or, or even 10 days. Um, once you see the forecast popping up, there's a lot of things happening behind the scenes to make it, to, to put everything together. And, uh, and then the, the forecast disappears and you basically did it for nothing and you keep monitoring the world, um, which is quite hard for if you have a crew of, I don't know, in total, I think we were around 60, 70 people. Uh, including the safety team, the camera guys, uh, the local helpers, uh, the riders. Um, so it's a massive operation. And then if all those people have their tickets blocked and, and then last minute you say, we can't do it, we have to cancel it, then you take all those reservations back out. It's like so many people work into it for nothing. And, and that happens so many times, which never be, <laughs> no one has ever seen. Um, that if you pull it off in the end, it feels like such a relief that when everything comes together, um, well, that we needed a break. And then we came up with a contest, which is not, um, or a format, which is, wasn't as big of a mission, not three missions. It was basically one mission where we looked at an, a region which, which was working kind of safely for us, Ireland, uh, UK area. Uh, we, it, 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 like two of the last storm chases have been there so that we knew that works logistic wise. Yeah. That was the one where, uh, Jager in the end won. the format was that the top four from the previous storm chase automatically qualified. And we had 10 challenges basically in a, in a nominee as nominees and four out of those in the end went to compete against the, the previous four. So we had a crew of, of eight and that was it evolved from have amateurs involved and basically not being able to water start in those winds to 
what we've seen in the last storm chase where the guys were doing doubles push forwards and everybody was a full professional from the safety crew to the riders, um, everybody involved. Yeah, the evolution has been pretty cool evolution, I guess, from a little idea to a huge, huge event. But yeah, like, how come you decided to just focus on like one event and only focus in like the British Isles, for instance? Is it just too much hassle? Um, we we looked actually at the Northern Hemisphere. We had a uh, we had the window open to like the 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 window of the time where we said this is going this is the time where it's going to happen was not working for the southern hemisphere anyways it was in our northern hemisphere winter and um we had to look at destinations where we could actually get to with a big of the big part of the crew by car um we don't want it to put everybody into planes and uh so for us logistically it just it just worked much better to have a place like Ireland or UK where we can send a big part of the crew by car and don't create those massive costs, um, which yeah makes the whole operation always more tricky to, to get going. Oh, we yes. had a good partner as well. Like in the last one, uh, we had on top of Red Bull, we had Mercedes. So they helped a lot with a fleet of cars and that was for us uh, was also one of the reasons why we could actually uh, do it. I guess like somewhere like Tasmania, it must have been like, yeah, the cost in that must be huge to get 60 people over there. Yeah, a lot of the crew have been local in Tasmania and we got some video guys from, from uh, Australia over. Okay. Um, but then, yeah, for us as the, the core team, it was crazy to get there. I mean, I got the call, I was in Tenerife after the contest and I got the call, it's going to happen, or I was in constant contact with the office in Hamburg, and then I had a, something like a 60-hour, 50-hour travel time to be in Marawa in the end, um, which is, yeah, it's kind of crazy if you think about it. So moving on to the picking process on what riders go. Obviously, Jager, you saw like the, the, three, the three ones in the past from Tasmania and Cornwall and everywhere. Were you like always wanting to do it? Did you think you would be like picked to do that? Yeah, it was, uh, it was definitely something I always wanted to do. And the idea of it appealed to me quite a bit. All the guys that did it previously over those early, earlier years, actually, I, I watched it like a hawk, I suppose. I, and I really wanted to be there. But, um, you know, university got in the way and, and I was very young as well. So it was a bit of a goal I set. Um, and I was quite focused on, you know, trying to get selected for that. Uh, given the level of windsurfing on tour, you know, I, I was never sure if I was going to get selected. But those years leading up to the to the selection process, I, uh, I had some good results and, and performed okay in Pozo and places like that as well. So, yeah, I put my, my hat in the bucket and, and was lucky enough to get selected. Mm -hmm. And class, were you involved in, in the process or is it a, a group of people? Um, I'm, I'm involved in the process, yeah, but it's, it's a group of people, of course. Uh, we had uh, JC involved, we had Duncan involved, we had uh, myself, uh, Jobs, the organizer. Um, it was a group of, uh, we called it experts, uh, who in the end had to make the call uh, who of these guys will, will join. It, it was always the plan to have at least one, one kind of local rider involved which is good for traveling, but also good for the local media. And then have it like a, a good mix of different personalities in there. And Jager was always one of our top guys to, to, to join that crew because he's from a completely different part of the world. He's a crazy talent in all sorts of conditions. And he's not afraid to hold back, especially when it gets gnarly. So that's one of the key characteristics that you have to bring when you get to the storm chase if you're known to be a guy who's kind of let the other guys go first then um then that's not the the the, the right storm chase attitude and storm chase is kind of it's kind of hard you you just you cannot control it really you have to have the ability to to switch off a little bit and just go and um trust that uh things will go right i mean we have the massive the crazy safety setup like no one, no other contest in the world has a safety setup like that. Uh, we do crazy stuff in Pozo as well, where we have basically one ski and that's it. 
Um, so this, this, the storm chase builds kind of the surrounding to actually ride those crazy conditions, which seem for non windsurfers seem completely like out of this world. Yeah. Definitely. And Jager, like when you found out that you were picked, how was that feeling? Were you like excited that you got in or were you just like, Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A little bit of both. Um, I was pretty excited, but, I think we were uh, we were on hold for two or three years, I think. Yeah, and then in the end, it, it came down to, you know, a very last-minute decision, and um, I wasn't even sure if I was going to be able to get there or not. So there were there were a lot of emotions. Um, like I was obviously very, very happy and um, lucky to be selected, and then when that call was made and it was confirmed, then that just turns to nerves and fear and a little bit of anxiety, I suppose. But yeah. It was, it was tough. Yeah. And like, I, I mean, I saw, cause it, you just said it was on hold for a couple of years. And um, I remember seeing, I think Ben did like a, one of the training diaries and saying how you were training like in full yeah. gloves, hood <laughs> yeah. in like 30 degrees Australia. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was something I had to um, get my head around getting used to and, um, you know, being able to windsurf in, in that amount of rubber and, and those wetsuits is something that I've, I've never done. So I, I wanted to be prepared and I didn't want to go there and, and not have any idea. So, yeah, I, I tried to get used to wearing a hood and gloves at home and boots. And it is, it's very, very different to what I'm used to. A hood can throw you out quite a bit as you don't have any noise. Um, and yeah, it's, it can be an uncomfortable feeling initially. Have you had any like false alarms at all? For sure, we had false alarms all the time. I mean, uh, it's part of the game that you're watching forecasts and uh, we all know it. You have a, a, like a, you see something popping up, a depression and it develops and there's a really high uncertainty in the forecast at the beginning first couple of days sometimes you you follow something you think oh that could develop into the right storm and then it completely disappears and changes track and um that happens all the time like there's multiple storms that didn't come together but we need logistically we need to track them from at least 10 days in advance so every th little thing that pops up somewhere is uh, that you would normally not even see on wind guru um, we we go in longer range forecasts and we have we had our own forecaster team here which is a, like a media company from uh, from Kiel they did our own storm chase uh, professional forecasting we had that the whole time that you see something coming up and that then you pull all the strings and you you send messages to all the riders i don't know how many times i sent the messages hey guys send me your location what is your nearest airport are you ready to go? Do you have your small stuff and, and all those things? And then uh, it's just a false alarm again. I had to kick their butts even harder because there's so many false alarms that in the end they don't, they don't take you serious when you tell them, hey, please send me a reply within the next six hours. In the end, you have to call the guys. It's a big relief when you finally say, when you finally get to a day where you can say, today, 12 o'clock, we can we have the go time go go time and then just before you get the latest forecasts and you say okay now the last let's say four or five forecast runs have been really consistent always showing that storm and there's a big um, consistency in the forecast then um, we are we are kind of safe and even if we fail in the end we can kind of prove to all the investors that hey we based. Uh, our decision to go on our best knowledge on really good forecaster team on really uh, really high consistency in the forecast with a big probability of it actually coming together so in the end we never failed <laughs> we always when we gave a go it actually was really good so yeah. fingers crossed it stays that way if we do it again <laughs> yeah you, you definitely did a good job on on picking the right day for the riders and maybe for some of the organizers around you like on the traveling there were you more worried that there was going to be like way too much wind and too crazy or not enough uh from my side i was more scared that the system is gonna 
change direction and is gonna not gonna hit us full strength. It's always better to stop at some point because it gets too windy, too crazy, and then you always get the end or the beginning where it's where it's kind of fine to sail. Um, for the whole drama of the storm chase, that always is nice when you can say, okay, now it's the limit is reached and we have to stop, and then it's good good for the story and good for the images too. You still get some crazy images of water flying around and, and guys holding their gear down on the beach and things like that. But if we would have, like the system would have missed us, we get, let's say 35 knots and the conditions are kind of lame and average. Um, then that's not the images you want to connect with the storm chase. You know, the, mm. the bar has been set pretty high in the yeah. storm chase and people expect something extreme. And if then after, a long waiting period. I mean, we were waiting for this last one for about three years. It was basically the last week of the waiting period of the third winter we've been waiting. And we had this discussion, should we go for something? Shouldn't we? Uh, and then just before the end of the waiting period, I mean, we already extended the waiting period. And just before the end, this system came up and was just like, what is this happening now? <laughs> Is this thing coming now after three years in the last week where basically uh, everything was kind of about to fall apart? And uh, yeah, then we, got, then we got that storm and that was epic. Oh, I was more worried that, there was, that it was going to be too much for me, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. I was too worried that I might die and not come home. <laughs> um, I didn't really know what to expect, so... That was something I had to deal with on the way over there, you know, like sitting on the plane and you have this amazing opportunity and you get a phone call and like I got a phone call at, or a message at six in the morning being like, it looks like we'll be on. And then I was driving to the airport and I didn't get my ticket until I was pretty much at the airport checking in, you know, and then sitting on the plane and being like, I could just stay in bed and be comfortable, you know, <laughs> yeah. jumping on a plane to go windsurf in this storm. It's going to be freezing cold, massive and scary. And I mean, I, I love doing that stuff, but it, you are going out of your comfort zone a bit. And uh, I don't know, I guess I, I've always looked up to guys like Thomas and, and really valued um, his approach to things. And, and he's crazy, you know, and I would love to, and, and I enjoy it as well, as much as it scares me, but I love those situations where it, it is a little bit challenging or scary and, you know, trying to find that biggest wave to hit or, or doing a massive jump. There's, there's something about that that draws you into it as well. So it was a real, uh, yeah, nervous <laughs> one, excited the next. It was, it was a lot of emotions going on. Yeah. How did your family and friends react when you are going off were they scared for you as well yeah i think a bit of both you know excited for the opportunity but sort of the unknown as well uh it's it's hard to say i think a few people were pretty happy when i came home and it was all okay and <laughs> yeah yeah it was good i know it was a big storm and it was all over Ireland. so where do you actually decide exactly which spot to go because i guess you're looking for that difference between you don't want it like super sketchy like rocks and reef and you know the health and safety. oh you need a you need a place that is kind of safe um that that why we are we are looking for kind of an arena where nobody can get lost at the same time uh we need to have a place where we can launch the, the safety skis safely and have all like uh, the safety setup is the biggest aspect and um, that's why we are looking at spots and over the years, we got more, more and more experience which spots actually work and which wouldn't work. And uh, so Margarotti, the place where we went in the end, was the dream location because it's like an arena. It has a little, a little harbor wall where you can launch safely. Uh, it's really sheltered on the inside and then outside you get those really good and crazy seas. Um, and it's kind of a wave magnet that works also on slight changes in the wind direction. We were, we were looking for spots like that, but the moment where we all flew to Ireland, we were not sure if it's going to hit because that was, I think maybe three or four days before the storm actually hit. And we were not hundred percent sure 
if it's gonna go taking a more southerly path or if it's going more northerly and where it's gonna hit. And so then uh, Jobs, the organizer, he just called me up and he said, okay, we have these two scenarios. Um, should we move south or should we move north? Should we go like Brandon Bay area or to the north northwest of Ireland? So um, in the end, then, then I had Finn and Timo Mullen on the phone. Even Duncan got involved, even, even though he wasn't in, in, in Japan. Uh, but he, he gave me the head judge position um, because he wasn't available. So I, had, I kind of had to make the call. And in the end, it was, I was lucky. <laughs> I made the right call. But um, it's a tricky one. If you suddenly say we're going north and then everybody's on the road and you see it's actually going the other way, then uh, you have to move 60, 70 people through the country to a different location, which is not good. <laughs> right. Jager, how did you find the spot in the end? Was it a good uh, decision? Yeah, it was, um, it was really cool. And it was good to get there a couple of days early and, and see the break as it would be normally, I suppose, because on the day it was, I mean, it started relatively normal and then it just got more and more chaotic. And what we knew was there before um, it was, you were able to, you were unable to recognize it. So yeah, Magarotti was, it was a beautiful little town and, and it was set up perfectly. Really. We could windsurf the outer reef break um, up until one point of the day. And then it just got too out of control and too big. So it was almost impossible to get out there. And that's when we had the option inside the bay as well. So um, yeah, it was super cool. It actually reminded me a little bit of, when it did have some um, structure to it, it reminded me to a bit of Margaret River and just, you know, that sort of big, heavy first bowl. And it was, yeah, it was, it was a well-run event throughout the day in that bay. You had to, like, wear lots of impact stuff and take us through what you actually had to wear for the safety side of things. Yeah, so, I mean, we were all quite protected with, with our wetsuits that we had on. So we had really thick wetsuits with a hood and gloves and booties for most of us. Um, and then we had Red Bull, Storm Chase, life vests, essentially. So these came with like an EPIRB, I think, class and, and a whistle and a flashing light as well. And they were really buoyant. Yeah, I mean, you you felt very safe. All the water crew, I know Finn and Timo and those guys are the real deal you know they know how to deal with heavy situations and and they do that stuff because they enjoy it so you felt very safe and something i remember is you know at the start timo said you know a lot of you have probably had these ideas and dreams that you just want to go as big as possible but you know maybe you've been a bit concerned about the safety side of it or who's watching you and he was like these are those conditions and you have that opportunity now to go for whatever you want with one of the best safety crew crews in the world watching you. So that was, uh, that was pretty cool. I think the hardest thing with the vest was the buoyancy. You know, I, I've had a couple of big wipeouts and yeah, you, you got pushed. There was one I remember where I got pushed quite deep and, and with the hood, I, I opened my eyes just to get my orientation, but you floated back to the surface quite easy. So it helped you relax in that sense if you were in the water. But the difficult thing was jumping. So having that amount of buoyancy, when you hit the water, you, you didn't sink as much as normal. So everyone had really sore necks over the next few days. Yeah. So like Jake, you mentioned that, but class, like spectating and being sort of behind the scenes, were you actually nervous for these guys? Or were you pretty like, sure that the safety crew had everything you know there were moments where we had these massive squalls coming through and we didn't have those in the other storm chases it was pretty straightforward it was good side and everything was running clean but in this one we had these massive fronts and uh, we made a system where at some point if it gets too bad i would cancel the heat but not completely cancel and resale i would just stop the stop the clock and uh, and then when it looks better, just send the guys out and get their remaining, let's say, five minutes. And I had to do that several times. But the good thing was the 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 setup there in Magorati was so good for it that you could easily get the guys inside. They can get shelter under the sail or whatever in the hail, 
and then and then continue their 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 minutes because the scoring system is not like you're sailing man on man and whoever has the better score advances it's just you collect your score throughout the entire day or even days and so basically sailing for yourself and you all you need is time on the water to perform your things and and collect scores so even if you if you think you had three sessions that were kind of average you can just pump up your score in that last session and bust out a couple of good wave moves and, and jumps. And it's not against the guy you're sailing, sailing that heat with. It's just for yourself, basically. Quite like a different moment, format to the PWA. Is completely in like different format. It has to be, you have to take the pressure away from the guys to deliver in that last minute, that double. When the conditions are like, you have 70 knots, gusts, hailstorm, you don't want to force the riders into that. They, they should just say, okay, now it gets too hard. I uh, I gonna do that in the next session when maybe it's only blowing fifty five knots, <laughs> something yeah. like that. Um, but yeah, otherwise I of course you always you're nervous when you have basically it's your control when you send them out. But then knowing that you have first of all just hundred percent professionals in the water, uh, sailing wise, but then also on the skis, so like both sides were a really yeah felt made me feel feel quite safe yeah for sure yeah i was just gonna say you know like it was quite nice having an event in that format it definitely uh reduced the amount of stress and pressure you feel with having to perform you know in in 12 minutes which we normally do and sometimes things don't line up in that amount of time no matter how good you are or how hard you try i mean the best guys you know do always tend to uh come out on top anyway but it was really nice having a little bit more time and knowing that with the format the way it was run we had so many opportunities and I think the way I saw it was you were always just trying to sail a little bit better than your last heat and everyone was just competing against probably themselves and and just trying to get comfortable in the in the conditions. Sure do you think you'd like to see like a similar format on the world tour I mean, probably for the, the riders would love to see something like that, but maybe the yeah. spectators wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's a tricky one. And uh, conditions change so much on the world tour as well. And there's always deadlines and uh, certain time frames that need to be met. Yeah, the, and the judging criteria is different as well. You know, like they're looking at length of ride and it's not as such on an extreme level, even though what we see in Pozo sometimes is is probably pretty extreme as well. And like uh, from that competition side, like Jager especially, did you feel like a big difference between like the atmosphere of a, a World Cup event where you're all fighting against each other? Was it more like everyone's together in this sort of thing? Yeah, I think it was a lot of it was just about having fun and seeing where we could push the sport. I mean, we're all competitive and, and competing against each other and always want to better each other, but we are all really good friends as well. And it's something that was very new to a lot of us. So, you know, no one really knew what to expect or really had too big of expectations on themselves. So, yeah, it was it was very friendly. Everyone stayed together. Um, the way the format was run, you know, you had these opportunities. It wasn't like you got eliminated straight away if, if you had a really bad first heat. And everyone got more comfortable as it went on. So it was quite nice knowing that, you know, you were just trying to put up your best five jumps and best five wave rides over the heats that you had over those two days. Yeah, it was it was just it was good fun to to sail with the different guys and experience conditions that are absolutely crazy. For sure. It's been every single single one of the storm chases has been it's been a bit of a special atmosphere. Like after, in the beginning there's always this excitement and a little bit of like everyone is a little bit scared of what's coming. But then afterwards you have that, yes, we did it. And it's everybody, like the whole crew um moves together and is the feeling of uh yeah we've seen something exceptional you know from the crew to the riders everybody's like super stoked afterwards and that that's always been a really good atmosphere in every single storm chase yeah i gotta say like this the latest one especially was great for people like me spectating because you had like the whole social media side of it which um, we didn't really have as much on the other ones where like you got like constant updates 
that really helps uh, on the latest one to like, feel part of it from, from sitting at home. People joining us just for that. Yeah. We have different teams and I was basically running the sports team. So I had the, the head of the event on one mic. I had the safety crew on another mic and a sports, uh, a guy that was kind of a runner for, for, the, for the riders as a third mic, <laughs> mic radio. And, uh, but I wasn't involved in the whole media thing. Like every now and then I spoke to the, the head of the media guys because they wanted something specially. Uh, like they asked me once for a, to, to repeat something I said to the writers through the radio just so they get it. But otherwise I'm, I was not in contact with the guys. Obviously you're involved in the different ones. Has, has the competition format changed? Like the, that format that we did in the end was a format that I was thinking about for that, the, the second storm chase where we started competing. The first one wasn't a contest format. And then the second one, I was thinking, how can we do it? How can we make it exciting? How can we make it good for the riders, but also exciting to watch? So um, we thought we just focus on the biggest stuff. Like we focus, we score the biggest five jumps, uh, like the, the best five jumps and the best five waves with focus on being radical, not on the longest wave. But then we did another factor in there, which we haven't mentioned yet. We gave extra points for the highest jump of the contest yeah. and the sickest hit. Yeah. And um, that in, initially we wanted to have the whole uh, media crew, the whole Storm Chase crew deciding on that. It turned out that it doesn't really work because everybody's just running different directions uh, and afterwards we just got together in the end with the judges and we, every time we saw something exceptionally high or, uh, exceptionally radical on the wave, we just marked those scores. And then after, after the day we got together and then we agreed on which was the highest jump, um, which was which, for us from our perspective where we sat, which was the highest jump, which was the, the most radical hit, which thing impressed us the most and that those get and got five points extra so that's some that was something that adds to the format um media wise as well because in the end i know from world cup zilt uh you can do the sickest rotation trick if it's like this high uh, people are not going to scream even though if it's the most technical thing but then if somebody busts out a 10 meter stall rocket air basically or or just this bolt forward everybody goes crazy so the general interest media loves to see big jumps so we thought we just throw a massive jump in there even if it's just a floaty jump guys just went for massive rocket airs just to um just to get those scores because they matter in yeah. the end was that you as well Jager, just going for some rocket airs <laughs> yeah i think it was uh it was so crazy in the end i was on my three zero and I could hardly hold on. Like even getting to the water was difficult, but I remember some of the last runs just going through my head, just being like, this will be the biggest jump of my life, no doubt. And just wanting it, but it was so hard to keep your board flat on the water and to actually line up with the wave that, uh, I mean, yeah, we did some big jumps, but when the wind actually isn't that wind, I think when it's that windy, you need things to line up for you, you know, because it is so out of control. Um, and that was, that was one of the tough things. And, and just the physical side of it as well, you know, like you can only last in those conditions for 10, 15, 20 minutes, and then your hands just start cramping and you start to lose your strength. So um, yeah, you had to be onto it. So obviously we have some events on the tour, especially Poza, that are just nuclear windy sometimes. How do you compare like the winds you get in Poza sometimes to like the storm shows? I think you adapt to certain things. So like in Poza, when you first get there, it's incredibly windy. But, you know, over, over a week or two weeks, you get used to it and you get used to your small gear. And a really windy day there, you know, I'll still be overpowered on 3-0, but I'll have some sense of control and, and it's warm, it's, it's sunny, it's, uh, yeah, those, those other elements that are in the storm chase aren't quite as extreme. So the hard thing for the storm chase was, like class said before, there were some squalls coming through and 
in those squalls, it was like hail or ice, you know, and um, I was on 3-3 and 3-0. We had bigger waves, so going on such a small sail, when you were in front of the wave or, or just in front of the white water, you would have this big wind shadow, so you would have no power and get mowed down. And, um, yeah, you know, on those really strong gusts, like, I don't think I've ever sailed in anything as strong as that where you were worried about your gear blowing away while you were just walking to the water. You know? Like yeah. there was one episode where I, where I had to sit on my gear on the beach just to stop it from blowing away. And, it, yeah, it was, it was insane how windy it was. I guess, like, some, something that people might not realise is because it's colder, like, the air is a lot denser. So it creates, like, a more thought, like, the wind must feel, like, heavier almost on the side. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that probably is the case. It just, you know, that cold, dense air. And like I said, mentioned before as well, you lose a lot of your strength quite quickly and your fingers and hands get really cold. So it's a lot different to holding on to 50 knots in Pozo, for example, which is still really strong, but... Yeah, it's not as physical purely for those reasons. You actually said it was the first time you saw snow, so pretty... Yeah, yeah, it was tough. Like, I couldn't believe how much my hands hurt when I came out of the water. So it, you just felt like your hands were going to explode or like someone was slowly um, sticking a nail through your fingernail, you know? <laughs> like, I could not get over how painful that was, but... Then after maybe two or three minutes, it would settle and, and you could feel your hands again. So, yeah, it was a very different situation for a lot of us. And, you know, guys like Leon and Toma, they would sail in that stuff quite often, I'd imagine. So they are quite comfortable and cool characters, you know. Mm. And Ricardo's from a tropical island, essentially, and I'm from Australia, so it's a bit different. Yeah, so that the wind, the cold and, and the waves, how were the waves? Yeah, the waves were pretty interesting. So the first day, it wasn't huge, but it was really windy and a little bit more onshore. So that was the day where a lot of guys focused on their jumps. I think that's the day where Philip did that really high stalled forward in the beginning. Yeah. And then the second day, even in the morning, it, it wasn't huge, but then... As the day went on, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, I think by the end of the day, I mean, because we were on, you know, three, three, three zeros as well, it was easily mast to mast and a half. And I would say some double mast high waves way out the back into the channel as well. I remember watching, I think it was um, Philip and Robbie's last heat. This was outside of the bay, like they were trying to get out to the point again. And I think I was the heat following them. And so they pretty much tried for like 20 minutes trying to get out in these mask and a half, double mask closeouts. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I was just sitting on the beach going like, Jesus, you know, I'm, I've got to go out there next. So they ended, it ended up being too difficult to get out and the safety crew and whatnot, there was no way they could keep an eye on you at that point. So we moved it inside the bay and um, that's when it started to become a bit more jumping focused again. Something that I think a lot of people wouldn't, wouldn't have known. <laughs> but um, it, was yeah. actually, it was actually too much for you guys. Yeah, it was, uh, it was just, you know, the bay and the way it was set up and... Yeah, the further and further you went out to sea, the sort of the bigger the swell lines got and the crazier it got. But I think the other hard thing that was quite scary was those squalls that came through, your, your visibility really reduced. And so you, you only had, you know, maybe 10 metre visibility in front of you. And obviously if you can't see then the safety guys can't see you either. So you did have to be quite cautious in those scenarios that, you know, if you did lose your gear or um, something broke, that you you were confident in your own ability to figure out what to do next. Um, so that was something you had to be aware of as well. That's crazy. Yeah, I guess you, you possibly sailed it in bigger ways, but like the combination with everything, the wind, the, the cold, yeah. everything together is just what makes it so extreme. 
Yeah, that's it. I, I don't think the waves were huge and um, everyone, you know, those the big waves, everyone was, you know, still able to give it a good crack and, and try and hit it. And there, there are definitely waves where you second guessed, you know, if you wanted to ride, ride it or not. But it was the whole situation um, together, I guess. Getting that balance as well, the organisers, of course, like we've seen uh, Tomo in in places in Ireland which uh, they look just ridiculously sketchy but it's yeah. hard to run a competition and like it's you know you, you want to actually be able to do something on, on, on yeah. the way. Yeah and that's it like it it is a really extreme contest and it asks a lot of you and it and it can create some amazing opportunities you know you do have the potential to do the biggest jump ever or ride one of the biggest waves ever in a contest situation this i guess this was a contest um trying to create something different and it also gave you the opportunity to maybe go a bit bigger or go to that next level again and you may only get one or two shots but it was pretty cool to have that opportunity and to you know have the support of red bull to to get you there and film it all and, and give you the safety crew that was needed as well. Yeah. Talking about the conditions class, do we have any like stats? Like how, how were the wind speeds exactly? I don't know exactly, but I think the guys measured something around 70 knots. Wow. Um, there was a moment where we had to move everything into the bay. It, w it just got too crazy on the outside. And uh, also we had to move our judging cars and, the crew cars further down into the bay and uh, we had those V Mercedes V-Class uh, vans for the riders and also for us as a judging car. We had two of the judges sitting in the car taking shelter and I had to kind of overlook the situation a little bit more so I was just standing next to the car and uh, we were parked right on the dune and at some point it got so windy that uh, Timo Mullen said to me, hey class, I think you should uh, you should better get in the car because if the car starts rolling, it's just going to roll right into you. <laughs> and I was like, Oh yeah, the car was moving so much and I couldn't really see it because I was standing next to it, but they were sitting inside and the car just went like moving like crazy. That's mental. Like I have a thing here and it's like, um, you know, force 10, which is a storm officially is 48 to 50 knots. Yeah. So you definitely got that, and and a, a fit like on the on the scale here, Force Twelve, which is a hurricane, is sixty four knots. So we got you got like incredible winds there for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah we got. I mean, <laughs> even in the very first one in Ireland, the guys measured I think seventy six knots, which was probably the windiest we've got in all the storm chasers. Um, yeah. But this one, I don't remember if it was sixty eight or if it was around seventy. It was. It was Force 12. Proper it was crazy, yeah. crazy windy, yeah. The guys rigged their smallest sails, like 3.0, uh, two point something, and just couldn't really hold on to it anymore. And Jagger, did you bring any like special or custom gear to help you in those mental conditions? Yeah, so I had a custom Severn uh, 2.7. But like I said before, I, because the waves were bigger, it was really, you had to, find the right gear because if you took too small of a sail you just got swamped mm. um, and it was really hard to outrun the waves so i don't think it really mattered what size you were on really like you were out of control no matter what size sail you're on so i used my 3-0 on 3-3 Severn. um they were custom sails for the red bull storm chase and for pozo and i used um a custom starboard stone surfboard as well, which had a little bit more of a drawn in tail. And that was just so, it's the same rocker line as I would normally use, but drawn in tail so I could at least bury some of the board in the water in those winds. But from the outside, it definitely looked like it helped. Like for the wave riding, like it's incredible because you're obviously an amazing, amazing wave rider, but to actually be able to wave ride in those conditions and still look like, Really good. It was really impressive to see. Like, yeah, uh, I don't know how good, how good I looked, but yeah, it was a lot of it. I thought 
was about finding control, you know, for jumps or waves. I think that was one of the most important things, finding a little bit of comfort and a little bit of control. So comfort, just keeping warm, eating between your heats, you know, trying to do the right things for your body and wearing the right wetsuits and gear. And then, yeah, making sure you made the right gear choices as well. And that, I think that made quite a big difference. I wanted to talk about um, a story I heard uh, with you, class, or or you both is like the day in between. I think the two the two storms you had pretty epic conditions on the beach, and uh, <laughs> you decided to take Adam's Adam's kit. Yeah, um, that was pretty epic. I mean, we had we had a permission to run the contest there only with certain safety setup uh, in place. And we knew there's going to be a day break in between where we cannot keep the whole crew on alert mode, even though we are not really running. And in that moment, the organizer had to kind of tell the riders, you cannot go out, even though it's kind of silly. It looks, conditions are kind of calm, it's not stormy, it's just glassy waves. But if somebody from the county shows up and sees you sailing there with a storm chase sticker or just being involved in the storm chase and then being in the water without all that setup, he said, it's a no go. We can't risk it. So the riders were not allowed to go. <laughs> and then Timo and I looked at each other. Okay, this is, this is our chance. So I, I grabbed the Adam's kid. And uh, we had the best session ever. It was just an hour or so where the, the safety crew, the, the guys were surfing. And then uh, Timo and I were, um, were just sailing that break by ourselves and probably like mast high clean down the line waves. I heard that Thomas got to the beach at some point. He got to the, to the office there and he said to Jobs, hey, who's, who's, who's sailing there? Fuck, I want to sail. <laughs> and then he realized it's, it's Timo and myself. And he got so mad. He was like, no way. I couldn't. I don't believe that you did that, that you told all of us we can't go. And then you just have the break for yourself. <laughs> yeah, but it was actually, we, we, I felt bad, but we kind of had to say, tell the guys, you have to take a day break. Sorry. And then uh, we didn't tell them initially that we're going to sail, but it just happened. Yeah, it looked good from the beach. It looked really good, but good on them for getting out there. Are you glad that you did it and would you do it again? Yeah, I think it's um, probably one of the best opportunities and experiences that I've had for sure. I loved every minute of it. It was all very new to me and I enjoyed the people and, and the landscape and the windsurfing. Yeah, it's, it's given me a lot of opportunities and I just loved, I love windsurfing in those conditions, I guess, and, and under those formats um, to really push as hard as you can. And yeah, I think, you know, like, I think those that week or whatever it was like the travel there, the comp and then travel back. I think I was on a, a massive high for that whole week. And then when I got home, I crashed really hard and I got really sick. And, you know, you question like that freezing cold and, and how much it beats up your body, but, and, and the scare, the, the nerves and excitement and all the anxiety and the fear and everything you feel, those emotions weigh down on you a bit, I guess. But, um, yeah, you'd do it again. You'd, you'd have to uh, – you'd definitely think about it because it's what you do. But it's one of those opportunities. You don't get them often. And you get a phone call from, you know, a massive company and they say, hey, look, um, there's this massive storm, you and the – seven or eight best guys in the world we want you to windsurf it and we'll look after you and film you know you know like that's pretty yeah. sick i'm pretty lucky to be a part of it yeah so class is there going to be a future storm chase and if so is there like a new format is there any has there been any news on that at all <laughs> um i would be surprised if there wouldn't be another edition at some point um and I think there's been some talks in the background between the head of organization, uh, Jobs from BSP and uh, Red Bull. Um, I think they agreed they want to continue, but there is no 
um, at least to me, there's no um, final format. And especially now with this year being a bit strange, um, I think there were some plans to do something even the end of this year, but uh, now everything has been put on, on hold. And um, yeah, I think I have to have a few phone calls to find out what's, what the exact situation is. But at the moment, I think you just can't plan exactly um, how it's going to continue. But I'm, I would be surprised if there wouldn't be another edition. Yeah, definitely looking forward to that one. And um, yeah, I almost forgot actually, but Jager, how's the, uh, how's the trophy? It's pretty big, eh? Yeah, it's, uh, it's really big. I love it. It's such a good trophy. And um, yeah, I look at it all the time and sort of smile and laugh about the whole experience, I guess. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I was lucky to get it home because it probably weighed about 10 kilos as well. Say, where have you got it? Uh, it's just at my parents' house. Um, okay. So, yeah, I'll leave it there and with some of my other trophies. It's good. It's definitely the biggest one I've won mm. and my favourite. I think we'll um, just finish off with, like, some really quick fire questions. So, winter or summer? Summer. I like, I like both. The storm okay. chase, of course, is the winter. Uh, yeah. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Hold my breath underwater for as long as I can. <laughs> Class? Teleportation. <laughs> when you've been traveling as much as I do, at some, some point it's not that interesting anymore to get in the plane and wait for 24 hours to arrive. Um, if I could just go like, and be on the beach in Hokeepa, would be pretty sick. <laughs> Love it. Um, okay, this is like a different one. What's your like unpopular windsurf opinion? I don't know. I'm probably pretty critical at um, pretty critical of wave riding and and the turns and differentiating between, you know, what I think is a good turn versus what someone else thinks a good turn. It's always subjective and it's opinion. So we'll leave it at that. <laughs> Klaus, there's a lot of people saying bad things about the PWA tour that it's just uh, going to shitty waves and it's just not going forward and so on and so on. Let's just say I don't agree putting the PWA in a bad light. I guess essentially like a lot of people think it's bad, but with what they've got, they're doing a good job. Yeah, exactly. With what they, with what they got, they're doing a good job and uh, working pretty hard to, to improve, which is a difficult task. Yeah, for sure. Um, and favorite windsurfer on tour? Oh, I, I think I, I look up to a lot of those top guys. I would say, you know, each guys have something pretty special and unique to themselves. Um, overall, you know, I, I look at Brow and his consistency is jumping, wave riding on both tacks and the stuff that he does. And I think that's pretty incredible. But there's, uh, yeah, a lot of other guys that are just as good and can do the same things. But, yeah, it's, uh, Brow is pretty good at what he does. You get him in the heat and you beat him, it's, it's good. But <laughs> if you don't beat him, then that's okay as well. So, yeah. <laughs> and for you, Klaus? <laughs> like, Victor is a very good friend of mine. And uh, I really like his whole attitude. He's really down to earth super humble guy i think there's nobody in the tour who would say anything bad about him and crazy radical on the water <laughs> the guy i probably love to watch most is i would say ricardo because there's always that x factor he's always on the limit <laughs> about to crash really hard <laughs> and then somehow he pulls it off or he crashes um which is which is pretty good to watch yeah i agree with that <laughs> Okay, and uh, if you weren't a windsurfer, what would you be? Yeah, maybe a physio. Um, yeah, I don't know. A fireman or a fisherman or something like that. I'd probably be a doctor. Um, my parents are doctors. My brothers are doctors. Uh, my grandparents are doctors. Initially, I wanted to study medicine. And then the whole windsurfing, windsurfing thing came up and I started to compete and then... I saw my brothers not really having so, or my older brother not really having so much time next to his uh, university for sailing. And then I decided mm, maybe I shouldn't, shouldn't do it. So I studied sports science and had a bit more 
freedom to uh, plan my courses, not always around the winter, so, so I was able to travel. That in the end made me become a pro windsurfer afterwards. And to, to end it all off, what would you say is your life motto? If you don't have a life motto, what sort of motivates you in life? Yeah, I don't really have a motto. I think I'll just try and uh, enjoy things and let things be lately. Try not to overthink things too much and just enjoy what I'm doing and enjoy it with the people that I have around me, I suppose, and appreciate how lucky I am to do what I do and have the opportunities that I have. Yeah, just remind myself of, of those things. Well, what motivates me is many things. I mean, having fun on the water is a great thing. Um, all sorts, like windsurfing, surfing, winging, foiling, whatever. Uh, that's like all of our passion, I would say. Then, of course, my kids, uh, my family. That's like the great motivation yeah, to move on and, and, and have a good time with them and also to work hard for them and like everything. We're living a pretty dream life and sometimes it's good to, uh, to put that to your mind and, and also appreciate that. Mm, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's super important for sure. Uh, well, that's been Klaus Vogget, Jager Stone and me, Lucas Melbourne. Uh, I really appreciate you guys coming on, uh, taking your time out to talk to me. Yeah, for those listening, it's been very stop and start, but we've got there in the end. I'm sure Jager wants to go to bed now. Almost bedtime, yeah. <laughs> but thanks again, guys. Cool. All right, cheers, Lucas. Cheers.